We are gathered today to launch the Pesticide Atlas, the Kenyan edition, and therefore it is a great day. We have uh, distinguished guests in our midst, uh, members of the public, uh, people from academia, and uh, different disciplines, and all of us are interested uh, in different aspects of pesticides in the country. And so just to lay the ball rolling, we all appreciate that we are in strange times. Currently, we could safely say that we have food insecurity uh, in the country. We are facing climate change and its impact and threat and we can even say that maybe we are facing an ecological Armageddon. And so there are questions and voices uh, as far as the causes and the solutions to these particular problems are. And today we'll be listening to different presenters painting a picture of the situation as it is. Uh, they will not only be speaking on their own behalf, but they are speaking also on behalf of the common man in the streets who simply wants to know whether their food is safe. They will be speaking also on behalf of the voiceless, like soil microorganism, insects and birds, which do not have the honor to speak about their predicament. We present the Pesticide Atlas Kenya edition today. I have the print edition here. I'm, I, I trust uh, you got your um, um, edition at the entrance. And um, here we have uh, the presentation of, us, of it. So um, the Atlas provides facts and figures about toxic chemicals in agriculture. And this is what we will be talking uh, about today. Um, not only in Kenya, but uh, our focus today is of course Kenya. We will present today analyzed data on the use of pesticide in this country. Uh, the HBF, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, launched the um, international edition of the Atlas only three days ago in Brussels uh, in the EU. Um, and here we are today already with the Kenya edition. So this edition contains 23 articles and infographs. Every article is um, accompanied by an infograph um, talking about the most important facts and figures. The information in those articles is based on data and facts, and that makes the article, um, the atlas, really particular and important in our opinion. Um, so the articles talk about the effects and the consequences of the ever-increasing use of pesticides. For example, the severe effects on health. 30, uh, uh, 385 million people globally fall ill every year from pesticides poisoning. 385 million. Most of these victims live in the global south. Uh, where environmental health and safety regulations are often weaker than in the global north. Please see, see for date details and sources in the article or, uh, starting on page 20. Um, and another ex uh, example, the consequences of pesticides use on biodiversity and the irre irreversible loss of species, especially pollinating insects globally. Several articles um, talk about that in detail on the global international level, but also in this country. In this context, we see an increase in the use of highly hazardous, hazardous pesticides, or HHPs as we uh, call them, um, globally on the global level and as well in Kenya. HHPs are substances that constitute a high level of acute or, or chronic risk to health and the environment. This is above all a global human rights concern. 
and human rights organizations are starting to talk about it increasingly. Some countries stop the use of certain pesticides um, classified as highly hazardous. For example, the European Union and its member states, and particularly some of the member states. But European countries did not stop the selling of the same products. It stopped, um, it stopped uh, being marketed, marketed at home, stopped, did not stop the selling of these uh, products outside its jurisdiction and its borders. We will hear about that in the presentations today with regard to Kenya. This constitutes double standards and this needs to stop. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to another issue of concern, especially in this part of the world. The global pesticide market is increasing. Um, the African continent had so far a relatively low share of global, in, in global sales, below 5%. But this um, is changing and the African continent is considered a growing market, especially also for those uh, products that are considered highly hazardous and this is of course a great concern to us. Um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Nairobi uh, or the Green Foundation as we are also called works on sustainability, right to food, we work on human rights issues and gender democracy. Now uh, what we present here um, in the framework of our right to food work um, also through our program, the Route to Food Initiative is core to our program. Since years, um, we work on the effects, the damaging effects of pesticide use and on alternative to this use. And of course, we're not alone in the struggle for healthy and sustainable solutions in agriculture and environment. We and our partners in Kenya and everywhere else are part of a growing global movement, and this atlas um, is our contribution to it. I'd like, to, in, in particular, to thank the authors who contributed to the atlas. Some of us, uh, some of the authors are here with us today, and we will listen to their pre presentation later. I'm really looking forward to it. I also like to thank my colleagues at the Heinrich Böll Foundation and the Route to Food Initiative for their relentless work over years, uh, which made this event possible today. Thank you all. And also special thanks go to our partners, our friends um, who made this possible. And before I start, I would also like to mention that the German version um, just won a, a very big media prize in Germany, which we are very happy about. And uh, I also want to mention that the international version will also be followed by versions from various other countries apart from Kenya. So Nigeria is planning an atlas, uh, Brazil, Spain, Tunisia, Turkey, China, um, and these are just a few examples. So, but let's dive into the atlas now um, because time is running and I hope you understand that I can't explain all graphics in detail because of the time limitation, but I will just show you the most important takeaways and I hope I can evoke some curiosity so that you dive deeper into the atlas after this event. So let me start with this figure on global pesticide use. The amount of pesticides used globally increased by over 80% since 1990, and the market had, has almost doubled in the last 20 years. Today, pesticide consumption worldwide stands at 4 million tons globally. And as you can see here in this figure, while the pesticide use in Europe and in the US remains more or less the same at around 480,000 tons, we can see a drastic increase in South America, as well as in Latin America, Australia, and also in Africa. The different colors you can see here with gray, um, yellow, and orange show you the intensity of pesticide use. And one can clearly see that the intensity is highest in North and South America, partly due to vast areas of monoculture, for example, soya, and still lowest in Africa. 
And this is why pesticide companies focusing more and more on the African continent to increase their market value. So where's the, where's the highest increase in pesticide import and use is seen in Western Africa, as you can see here in this slide with the orange line. Also East Africa imports and use increased substantially. According to the Agrochemical Association of Kenya, pesticide imports to Kenya have increased rapidly from 6,400 tons in 2015 to 15,600 tons in 2018. But despite the increase in pesticide use, approval requirements are often not stringent enough and regulatory authorities are very often under capacity and understaffed. Companies argue that synthetic inputs like pesticides will increase crop production to ensure food security and nutrition, especially during the crises we are in right now. However, Despite the pesticide use is increasing, the prevalence of undernourishment is still steadily increasing in all parts of the African continent, as you can see in this slide. So the question arises: are pesticides the right answer to overcome this problem? Detailed statistics on the use of pesticides, including type of pesticides, also volume, area, and crop-specific pesticide use, they are all not available in Kenya, but not only not in Kenya, also in many other African countries and countries around the world. So for a study together with Root to Food initiative, we obtained pesticide sales data from 2020. And this map you can see here shows you the distribution of pesticide use in the country based on crop production patterns and pesticide use per crop. You can see with the different colors in red, uh, you can see high use and in light green, there is no use at all. And large parts of the country using high volumes of pesticides, especially in Western Kenya, the Rift region and Central region. So an analysis of these data from 2020, which I just mentioned, revealed that a total of 310 products were used by farmers containing 151 active ingredients with a total volume of around 3,000 tons equal to $73 million. So these are the data for Kenya. But used volumes of pesticides alone tell us little about the risks to humans and the environment. So other factors such as toxicity of the substance also plays a role. And the sales data show that 76% of the total volume of pesticides sold in Kenya, which equals to 195 products, contain one or more active ingredients that are categorized as highly hazardous pesticides. And these are pesticides that are proven to present a particularly high level of acute and chronic risk to humans or the environment. And it also needs to be considered that many products consist of two or even more of these toxic active ingredients. For example, four out of nine products that contain the active ingredient chlorpyrifos contain a second ingredient, for example, beta cyflothrine or cypermethrine that are toxic by themselves. So this will certainly have an additive unknown effect to the risk towards environment and human health. Another interesting fact is that only seven products, which equals to 2% of the total volume of pesticides used in Kenya, belong to biopesticides. These are substances that are made out of natural products and that are more environmental and human health friendly and that can assist in a more sustainable pest management. As Kenya can't formulate their own products, they fully rely on imports of pesticides. And this figure shows you the sales data by companies. And in Kenya, Syngenta sold most of the pesticides in terms of volume, followed by UPL from India and Bayer from Germany. And one can see easily that the sale of highly hazardous pesticides highlighted in, in red is a big business as they make up at least 70% in almost all company sales profiles.
So measures to inform and protect farmers about the dangers of pesticides is particularly important when using highly toxic pesticides. But mitigation measures are often not implemented because farmers lack knowledge on risk mitigation strategies or because, because required protocols are just not practical, practical for Kenyan situations. Like, for example, a wide, a 20 meter wide buffer zone to rivers or to protected areas or even to households. In many cases, farmers do not wear personal protective equipment, as this slide uh, shows you. Only 15% of the farmers wear the full required equipment to protect themselves. And 11% understand the color bands on the label. This is worrying when we consider that 76% 76, 76 of all pesticides are highly hazardous pesticides with partly serious chronic risks like neurotoxicity, reproduction toxicity, or even carcinogenicity. And very often hot climates make wearing such equipment impossible, which creates additional problems. It is also striking that almost half of the farmers do not follow pre-harvest interval recommendations. And the this is the time between the last pesticide application and the harvesting and selling of the crop. And very often the lack of awareness, but also the lack of uh, continuous and stable markets access is the reason. So this means the use of these highly pest toxic pesticides can lead to residues in food to which Kenyan consumers are constantly exposed. To protect consumers from pesticide residues in food, governments are usually mandated to take regulatory action for public health protection by setting residue levels that may be allowed in food items being consumed in the country, entering or leaving various countries. And this is called the maximum residue level or the MRL. Maxi maximum residue levels are normally based on the cultivation practices, the toxicity of the active ingredient and the food consumption of the consumers. Kenya's regulatory authority, the Pest Control Product Board, in most cases adopts the same MRLs that are used in Europe or the US. And this is worrying because local diets are different in Kenya. Maize, a staple food, is consumed in greater quantities than it is in Europe and should therefore have stricter limits for pesticide residues. Sensitive groups such as pregnant women or children are particularly at risk and should have stricter limits. In Kenya in 2020, a total of 25 different active ingredients were found in tomato and kale samples. 51% of the detective active ingredients are banned in Europe and, are, and some are categorized as highly hazardous pesticides. And 60% of all the samples exceeded the EU re maximum residue level. So it's alarming in particular because these two vegetables are used in many Kenyan diets. Another alarming result is that a maximum of eight different pesticides have been detected on one sample. So at the same time, do health ex experts criticize that there are no MRLs for multiple residues in food. So for each approved active ingredient, the European Union specifies the maximum concentration of residues to be legally permitted in various foods. And if, the, if goods exceed these limits, they may not be placed on the market. And a regular European monitoring system is in place, and some results are shown in this graphic. The number of apple samples with multiple residues increased over time from 1997 to 2018. Whereas the number of pepper and strawberries without residues decreased. There's no regular monitoring uh, system for the Kenyan market in place. Kenyan consumers simply don't know the pesticide exposure they are facing. So whereas products for exports are tested regularly and results in, in exceeding the MRLs in some instances, as just recently with two high levels of chloparifos in coffee exported to Japan, we don't know the situation for the local market. The result of the use of highly hazardous pesticides without practical mitigation measures can also be that farmers and families are exposed to pesticides which can also lead to poisoning effects. 
And this graphic shows you the poisoning cases in pink bubbles. And you can see that highest reported poisoning numbers occurred in Asia, followed by Eastern Africa. Although there are some limited data on poisoning cases worldwide, even less data exists on the potential chronic health effects of pesticides, like as I mentioned already, the carcinogenicity, reproduction toxicity, or the effect on the hormone system, the so-called endocrine disrupting pesticides. So United Nations experts have considered highly hazardous pesticides a global human rights concern for a long term or time already. Pesticides threaten, among others, the right to live in dignity, the right to bodily integrity, and the right to a healthy environment. But an international treaty to phase out highly hazardous pesticides does not exist. Pesticides do not only lead to health problems. Many of them are also toxic to important natural resources, such as bees, surface waters, or soil organisms. And monitoring programs on insect diversity, water, and soil quality are not in place in Kenya. Soils host more than 25% of the world's biodiversity and are the pillars of high yield and healthy fruit food production. But nearly two thirds of all agricultural land worldwide is contaminated by pesticides that impacts important soil organisms that are crucial for healthy soils. 317 agricultural topsoil samples from across the European Union were tested and almost half contained up to five different pesticide residues. And these residues can stay for a long time in these soils, depending on the persistence of the pesticide. How polluted Kenyan soils are, we don't know. The use of pesticides has also a fatal effect on biodiversity, as this figure shows you clearly. Conventionally managed fields on the right-hand side have five times lower plant species richness and about 20 times lower pollinator species richness compared to organic fields. Insects provide services such as pollination with a high economic value. Therefore, not only do pesticides pose a threat to biodiversity, but also to the economy. Imida clupid, an insecticide that belongs to the group of neonicotinoids, is proven to be very toxic to bees. According to the sales data, it is used regularly by farmers, mostly on wheat, maize, beans, and tomatoes. And this graph shows you the wide use in Kenya. In these areas, bees could be potentially threatened, highlighted in pink, but also the medium uh, um, volume of neonicotinoids, in this case, Emilia clopid in orange. And at the same time, farmers are often not aware about the toxicity to bees. A label on the pesticide container showing bee toxicity is missing, and no regular monitoring on bee populations is in place, although many crops are dependent on pollination. We know, for example, that 10% of bee species are threatened with extinction in Europe, but we don't know the status in Kenya. So here you can see the volume of pesticides used on different crops. And we can see, clearly see that maize currently requires the highest volume, followed by wheat, coffee, potatoes, and tomatoes. And again, the share of uh, highly hazardous pesticides used on all crops is very high, highlighted in red. And if we look a bit closer what pesticides has been used on maize and tomatoes, for example, one can see a big difference. Herbicides has been used on maize fields mainly, like 2,4-D, glyphosate, uh, paraquat, and atrazine. And the last two are banned in Europe. And tomatoes face a lot of fungal problems. So that's why mancozap is clearly the number one fungicide used on tomatoes, also withdrawn from the European market. And the red ones, again, are highlighted, uh, are, highlighted are the highly hazardous pesticides. So my last slide. Pesticides that are banned in the EU, many of them are highly hazardous pesticides, are currently still allowed to be produced and exported to other countries like Kenya and remain still to be a big business. The biggest export countries are UK, Italy and Germany. And the pie chart on the left hand side 
shows you to which continents banned pesticides are exported to. Africa, in the color orange, still plays a minor role with only a small share compared to pesticides being exported to the US, for example. But as already mentioned, pesticide companies see a potential growth here. On the right hand side, you can, you can see how much of the pesticide volume sold in Kenya is already banned in Europe. And again, these are based on the actual sales data of 2020. 44% um, and they are banned in Europe because the potential to cause severe environmental and human health effects are not acceptable for European citizens. Some of the top sellers here are Paraquat, Mancozap, Beta Ciflothrin, and Demidacloprid, all sold by European companies. The double standard in pesticide trade has been the focus of civil society movements around the world since many years. And finally, there are signs of stricter regulatory control of the use of toxic pesticides. In France, a law forbidding the manufacture, storage, and export if, of EU banned pesticides came into force in January this year. Switzerland has banned the export of five particular toxic pesticides since 2021. And more recently, Germany has reaffirmed its commitment to putting a legal stop to such exports in the future. But also importing countries have taken steps against double standards in pesticide trade. Tunisia, Mexico, and the Palestinian National Authority have imposed a ban on imports of pesticides that are forbidden in the exporting or producing country itself. South Africa has in April this year announced that certain pesticides will be phased out and completely banned by 2024. And very recently, Nigeria moved in the same direction. So hopefully Kenya is investing in research and training on alternatives to these pesticides and follow the direction of other countries. Uh, so my topic here is uh, small creatures, big impact. Um, I just want to uh, briefly uh, give this as an introductory slide. Uh, African agriculture is growing, uh, both in the staple food crop production and also more so in the horticulture sector, which is the most rapid uh, uh, agriculture sector that is growing in Africa. And these are some of the values of exports of horticulture that we are having uh, from Africa. And we are also consuming a lot of increasingly consuming vegetables, which we need to do more. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Yeah. Um, with this increasing intensity of production, both staple food crops, and here I've listed some of the horticulture crops, we are also increasingly finding uh, pest issues that are coming up, uh, which are both indigenous and uh, invasive species. More so, uh, the problem is with uh, invasive species. So what happens with an invasive species is when it comes into a system, it comes without the control agents that it is having in its native situation. So there is a free way for it to multiply and start causing major damages. And because of that, a system gets disrupted. People tend to use more pesticides to manage these invasive species, and it basically disrupts the whole system. So my talk will cover on some of the opportunities that we have to manage these invasive species much more in a, in a friendly way. Uh, we can move on to the next uh, slide. But most occasions when an invasive species comes, we are caught off guard. Most of the countries in Africa are caught off guard. And then our immediate response is uh, uh, use of uh, pesticides, uh, because at that moment of time, you need to protect the crop. We had a big locust invasion there, and there is a whole uh, 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 catastrophe that is happening. At that moment, there is a need for uh, protecting the crop uh, or protecting the situation there. In most occasions, the emergency response to invasive species is largely pesticide uh, oriented. Yeah? Um, but are there no alternatives to pesticides available? I would say no. It is available. There are uh, alternatives that are available. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is actually the diversity of living organisms in the world. More than 70% of uh, organisms or species that is living in the world are insects. So as much as, uh, uh, as, much as we uh, look at uh, insects as harmful, uh, can uh, cause issues to you, the harmful insects are only a very small subset of this vast diversity of beneficial insects that contributes to various uh, ecosystem services, which helps us uh, in different ways. So my presentation will be focused on some of these ecosystem services the insects, uh, beneficial insects can give 
for enhancing the crop productivity uh, and also uh, addressing issues related to uh, agriculture. So I'll start with the biocontrol uh, ecosystem services and uh, I'm just going to give you some examples of what happened in Kenya. Uh, this pest, diamond backmoth, which most of us know, uh, is a major cut, uh, pest on crucifers. Uh, it is highly resistant to pesticide sprays, causes around 6.8 tons of uh, yield loss per hectare uh, when uncontrolled. Uh, people can go up to 13 sprays uh, per season for managing this uh, uh, crop with pesticides. Uh, but uh, ACP with its uh, partners, we try to introduce a, a biological control approach for managing this uh, diamond back moth. So we introduced natural meas because uh, diamond back moth is not very indigenous to this region. So we introduced natural meas from its native uh, zone to establish the uh, natural regulatory factor. So the par parasite which is uh, on the top, diadigma semiclosum, was introduced from uh, Asia, Taiwan, and Cotesia vestalis uh, was introduced from South Africa into Kenya. Uh, so this uh, biocontrol uh, uh, works very well because diadigma semiclosum works effectively against uh, uh, um, Plutella zelostula in the higher altitudes, while Cotesia works effectively in the lower altitudes. So we released it in partnership with uh, uh, regulatory authorities in Kenya in different locations, and this resulted in 73% reduction in insecticide sprays, 4.7 tons uh, yield increase, and the benefit cost ratio on uh, investment on research was around 1 is to 32.1. More than 25 million US dollars for uh, uh, Kenya alone is expected in the next uh, uh, years to come. So this is another biology control effort which was done uh, by, spearheaded by IATA with many partners uh, across Africa. Uh, cassava mealybug got introduced into Africa from South America and it's rapidly spread into 25, 26 countries. This, uh, the introduction was in 1970s but it rapidly spread to 25 countries causing around 80% damage of cassava uh, crop. Um, the researchers found uh, a very effective parasitoid called as Anagaris lopacy. Uh, which was also introduced from South America to follow the uh, invasive species. Uh, and what it did is it effectively reduced the mealybug damage to less than 20% 20, 20 uh, when it was spread in around 27 African countries. And the economic uh, benefit that was estimated for this uh, biocontrol effort was around 9.4 billion US dollars across Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll quickly move on to the uh, next example of a biocontrol effort. Uh, you can move on the slides. So we are all aware of uh, this fruit flies. Whenever we fry, buy, buy a mango, uh, the mango gets spoiled quickly. We don't know what is happening. These are the uh, major damage causing fruit flies, which uh, completely uh, reduces uh, the, the yield and also uh, the ability of, for us to export mango outside to uh, uh, various other uh, markets. So here, uh, ICP and its partners, we introduced uh, uh, natural enemies uh, that can uh, safely manage the invasive fruit fly species uh, called as Bactrocera dorsalis. Um, uh, this, uh, the two parasites that were released are called as Phopius arizanus and Diacasmiphora uh, trioni. Uh, these were introduced from uh, Hawaii because the fruit flies came from Asia, but then uh, we couldn't get the natural mees from Asia. So this is also one challenge that uh, issues related to biodiversity protection uh, are uh, talked uh, in big ways, but sometimes it can be a challenge because uh, the, a country is ready to give out the, uh, a, a pest comes out of a country, but when you want to access a natural me, there are challenges that is there. <laughs> so we need to start uh, looking at that also, how this can be addressed, because otherwise such technologies cannot be scaled uh, widely. So we introduced this uh, uh, two natural me's. I'm not sure what is happening with the slide. Um, should I wait for some time as you sort this out? Okay, uh, as they are trying to sort this out, um, the parasitoids, when we released it uh, for the fruit fly uh, management uh, in more than uh, 10 uh, sub-Saharan African countries, in most of the regions where we released them, there is a quick decline in fruit fly infestations. But this is not just the one solution that you need to uh, have, because some of these parasitoids are not act as resistant to pesticides and other uh, sprays that are happening in the ecosystem. So you need to embed a, a biocontrol effort within a, an agroecological approach so that these natural means can survive and provide you uh, uh, benefits. Um, 
one. Uh, we have tried to uh, mass produce these uh, parasitoids effectively and then we have released them in uh, locations in Embu and other uh, five more counties in Kenya. And clearly what we see is uh, there is a significant increase in the parasitism percentage. Um, you can move on to the next one. Um, from 7% in the natural situation, uh, from 0% in the, uh, un, uh, 0 to 7% in when the parasitoids was not released, we are able to see increase in parasitism levels up to 50 to uh, 60%. Yeah, let's move on. So these are some of the countries where biocontrol effort has been promoted uh, and with clear economic benefits. The scaling of biocontrol efforts, I think uh, uh, whenever I talk about this, people say, are the private sector involved in this? I think in this case, there is more reason for uh, the governments to get involved into this because private sector, sector involvement requires a business. And a business happens only in, in a place where they can, uh, they can get this revenue regularly. But in this case, these parasitoids are naturally perpetuating the system. And uh, once released, there is no need for a release further, but just to conserve these natural means. And for this reason, uh, the governments have to uh, uh, contribute into this. I'll move on to the next uh, pollination, uh, the next ecosystem service, especially bee farming and pollination service. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Um, more than 75% of crops that we consume are uh, pollinated in one way or the other, uh, either 100% or in partial, yeah? Uh, if you look at the value of pollination services in Kenya and uh, uh, Ethiopia alone, it's close to $186 million per year and uh, $850 million per year. So in pollination services, uh, it contributes to the production of the crop, but also it contributes valuable products which can give livelihood opportunities for people. And when we look at pollinators, we normally feel it's honeybees. But uh, there are so many other uh, interesting pollinators that contribute critically to pollination services uh, in, in a crop system. Um, it's not just about the yield. It's, there are some information on how pollinators can contribute to yield increases in capsicum. These are some of the crops which typically depends on uh, pollinators for their productivity. Let's move on. Uh, so these are crops where, like for instance, a coca bit, 100% of the yield that a coca bit has comes from pollination, insect-related pollination, and it goes on uh, as it is presented in the graph. It's not just about the yield. Uh, uh, pollinators also contributes to the quality of the product. Like for instance, this is an information that uh, I picked from uh, that paper, Witsik et al. 2018, where strawberries, when it is pollinated and when it is not pollinated, uh, poorly pollinated, the quality completely differs. So clearly, both in quality and quantity, we require pollinators. And anything that we do in a crop uh, can disrupt these pollinators and uh, disrupt the yield. Avocado is a big crop that is being talked about in, in our country. Uh, but if you see avocados, it cannot be produced without effective pollination. There are so many other pollinators that contribute to the pollination services of avocado. And some of our research has actually indicated that just supplemental pollination alone, that is you add pollinators as a beehive in an avocado farm with uh, the wild uh, pollination that is happening, can increase the yield by 20%. So you don't need to do anything, just have one or two bees in an avocado farm and you can increase the yield by 20%. Yeah, let's go on. The last ecosystem service that I would like to say contributes more to the uh, uh, soil health. It's insects for food and feed and other uses. Uh, um, contributes to all these uh, uh, provisioning services, regulatory services and support services. I'll quickly move on to the next one, please. Uh, this is the global diversity of insects consumed. Insect consumption is not new in Africa. And uh, Africa, it has been traditional. Uh, more than 2,100 species of insects are consumed worldwide. And Africa, we have records of more than 542 species of insects uh, that are consumed. Um, yeah, let's move. It's not just direct consumption. It can also contribute to uh, another uh, spectrum. Like, for instance, our meat demand is increasing. And with our meat demand increasing, our uh, demand for feed is also increasing. And in the feed, uh, the key component that is required is proteins. And most of the proteins that currently goes into the feeds are soybeans, fish meals, uh, uh, oil seed cakes, and so on, which are actually proteins that we require uh, as well as compared to a livestock. So there is a clear deadlock. And insects like black soldier flies, which are currently being promoted across uh, uh, in Africa, uh, can contribute to break this deadlock. It's not just about uh, the insect. Uh, in terms of quality of the protein that they offer, is also quite high. 
as you see here the orange bar there clearly indicates that the protein level in uh, edible insects are much higher than the animal based proteins and also the plant based proteins uh, in kenya and uh, east africa what we have done is uh, we have tried to look at the proteins that can be produced from these insects and uh, formulate uh, feeds uh, so it's just that we can relieve the pressure of soybean and others and we also went to the various stakeholders to see their willingness more than 80 90% of the farmers are willing to adopt this uh, when it is available and we have tested the benefits in different systems uh, clearly an insect based protein uh, contributes to increased productivity of uh, poultry pigs and also the fish as it is uh, shown here let's move on it's not just the proteins one of the major component that can contribute to overall productivity increases in 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 africa is when these insects feed on organic waste they recycle them into organic fertilizers uh, the challenge of uh, accessing fertilizer is very pertinent at this point of time when we depend on uh, global markets to supply fertilizers and uh, clearly this organic fertilizer that uh, insects produce are rich in chitin and other protein sources uh, uh, and we have tested them on various crops and their efficacy tomatoes uh, french beans kale and maize clearly there is an increase in productivity or with this uh, organic fertilizers as compared to the conventional organic fertilizer and also compared to uh, synthetic organic fertilizers currently this technology is being scaled widely in east africa and we did some uh, socio economic assessment of the benefits of this technology just a mere 5 to 50% replacement of soybean from the poultry sector in kenya can contribute all this uh, uh, economic and social benefits that you see here uh, uh, there yeah Uh, but all this would not have been possible i would like to uh, thank the kenyan government and uh, uh, the governments in east africa they were quick to uh, establish the regulatory frameworks enabling policies to uh, uh, include insects in the feed otherwise it's considered as a contaminant and that resulted in a lot of private sector uh, interest which went into the sector and it is now currently rapidly growing uh, we as research institute are contributing to the research needs of this uh, sector and that's some statistics on how much people you have trained and so on and these are some of the private sector players who have uh, invested into uh, black soil of life farming and how much they are producing and with all this good work that we did the insects for food and feed program uh, was the winner for the food planet prize in 2020 yeah let's move on so i would like to con conclude uh, the talk uh, beneficial insects provide enormous ecosystem services however if you want to continue benefiting from them uh, we will need to uh, conserve them and how we conserve them is through uh, integrating them with sustainable farming practices natural processes environmental man management uh, uh, practices that needs to be scaled uh, in partnership with the governments in partnership with uh, the various stakeholders in the system we have just touched the uh, tip of this uh, vast biodiversity benefits that we can access we need to access this more and more as we want to uh, increase the uh, productivity of crops in africa my presentation today is about uh, towards a sustainable uh, agriculture uh, towards a better agriculture the case of the fall army worm as you know uh, maize is a very important crop is a vital crop in east africa and in several parts of africa because uh, it contributes to calorie intake uh, in many household and also income generation next slide so uh, i'm going to talk here uh, about cereals um, cereal production is constrained by several uh, stressors it includes uh, climate change poor soil fertility pest and disease and if you look at for instance a striga in the case of maize production it costs up to 2.4 billion dollars same also for stem borers 1.5 billion if you make the two it equates to the, the the foreign aid that we receive basically in africa and now come this new invader called the fall armyworm which arrived in africa in 2016 which is almost costing close to 6.5 billion dollars this fall armyworm comes from the americas and is adding another burden to already existing problems in cereal production so next slide so it's a very difficult pest to control because it has it's a noctuid it also also feeding habits that do not allow uh, to control it easily and also it's resistant to many classes of chemical pesticide so if no solution is found so many farmers 
and many countries will be exposed to hunger. So, uh, next slide. Now, when this pest came in 2017 in Kenya, governments were paranoid. Many of them decided to use, uh, to go for chemical pesticide that was being distributed to many farmers. But go to next. There is an interesting slide here, which is very similar to the slide presented by the presenter at the beginning, which show that in Africa, even though chemical pesticide use is increasing, there is still needs or ways to catch up because we have not polluted our environment so much. And this current outcry in requesting that we reduce chemical use is in line with what we are going to talk about this presentation. The use of chemical pesticide does not necessarily mean increase in yields. Actually, going for nature-based solution is the way to go because uh, as you increase the use of chemicals, you do not necessarily increase your yield because you are interfering with natural processes. Go to the next slide. So there is need in this context to promote environmentally friendly as well as agroecological option which must be adopted so that we can produce maize that is free of pests but also free of chemicals, residue, chemical residues. Next slide. So the folamium that we are going to talk about, this is its life cycle. It starts from the egg, a female laying eggs which will turn into larvae. You have several instars, six instars, which will turn into a pupae and then the cycle continues. It can be approximately one month, depending on you know, temperature. But when you want to design an integrated pest management framework, because controlling this pest, there's no single bullet for it, so you need to combine several tactics, which I'm going to break down one by one. And these tactics have to go alone along the life cycle. So here at ICPE, we have an, a framework whereby we consider several approaches you have already heard a uh, presentation from Dr. Subi about these natural enemies, how they act. But we also have other friends, like biopesticide. We also have uh, farming practices, but also monitoring of the pests. So, next slide. So, when the fall amium came to Africa, already ECP was promoting a technology we call the push pull, Sukumavuta. So, it's a technology that farmers called to inform us that actually the fall amium is not affecting farm, uh, farmers who have adopted these technologies. So go to the next slide. So what happened is that we found that those who did not adopt push-pull have their crop completely destroyed, and farmers who had adopted the push-pull technology experienced 80 percent reduction. And this was almost experienced in almost all parts of East Africa, in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Go to the next. So we also saw that there was basically uh, the mean damage plant within Kenya and certain location, compared monocrop, those who have done monocrop and those who have done uh, push-pull, as you can see, the, the damages was much higher in the monocropping system. So what is push-pull? Many people ask this question, and I'm, I'm still surprised that after 30 years we developed this technology, many people cannot yet define it. It's an intercropping uh, system whereby you have a crop of interest. It could be a cereal crop, it could be maize, it could be sorghum, it could be also upland rice, which you intercrop with a legume fodder called desmodium. Desmodium adds nitrogen into the soil and suppresses striga. Initially, it was developed to control stem borer and striga. And then, because it repels the moth that comes at night to lay eggs, so the moth is attracted to a border crop, which can be napier grass or brachiaria, okay? So this is how it looks like. Um, so it's a lot of chemistry, of course, agroecology and this environmentally friendly suggests a lot of chemistry involved. So a lot of soil health, a lot of um, uh, semiochemicals, but this one has to be broken down into a very simple technology. Go to the next slide. So we have three versions of push-pull. We have the original push-pull, which is using a desmodium silver leaf Desmodium uncinatum, which is intercropped with brachiaria. This is the second version of push-pull, which uses desmodium intortum, and then use brachiaria. And this is the last version, which uses an African desmodium, of which the seed can be produced here in Africa. 
and then use a border crop which is called uh, Brachiaria piata. So these three versions of push pull can reduce the pest up to 80%. If you can protect your maize crop up to 80%, then the remaining 20% could be uh, compensated by the natural processes such as good availability of water, natural enemies that are present, or minimal intervention such as use of concoction. So push pull helps in restoring the soil. The previous slide show rabbits and goats, which means that the companion crops could be used as excellent fodder to help the farmer increase meat production and be more resilient at household level. Next slide. So through the understanding of this mixed cropping, diversification and intensification, we came to realize that maize is actually the preferred crop to this fall armyworm. When you feed the fall armyworm with maize, it becomes big and very fat. But when you use beans and other types of intercrops, as you can see, the larvae are extremely very small. So it means that if you play around with a companion crops, diversity of crops, you can actually minimize the effect of this fall armyworm. So as you can see, compared to push pull, uh, intercropping with groundnut or with bean or with soybean, you will see that as compared to soil maize, you have a lot of healthy crop in blue. In blue are the crop that did not experience damage. Out of the old intercropping that we have seen, push pull has the highest benefit because most of the crops are healthy, followed by the other intercropping. But the control crop, most of the crop in the control are extremely damaged. You have few of the crops who have five percent who have not been touched. So go to the next slide. So biopesticide. What is a biopesticide? Go next. So biopesticide, these are just pesticides that are made out of living organism, microbial organism, or it can also be also um, nematodes, or it can also be botanicals. But we, we group them. Biopesticide usually refer to fungal base, uh, bacteria base, or viral base. So go to next. Out of the biopesticide, we have entomopathogenic fungi. They uh, act by contacts, okay? And then they eventually kill the pest. So go to next. So at ECP, there are two biopesticides that, that were already available in the market, but have been shown to be effective against the fall amium. They either kill the larvae, second and first instar, or, or they kill the, the, the eggs in case of ECP. Seven, and these are commercially available in Kenya, but we need to be scaled out. If you saw the infographic shown at the beginning, the use of pesticide is still very low as compared to chemical pesticide. Maybe there is an action that we need to take here. Um, continue. So we, as I said, these products are available. Go to next slide. We also have uh, uh, bacillus. Um, this is a uh, bacteria, but this one needs to be injected, ingested by the insect so that they can have an effect. They don't act by contact, but by ingestion. Go to the next slide. We also have some products that are registered in Kenya that could be used, okay? Go to the next slide. We have also viruses. Viruses also have to be ingested, and also they act the same way, and these are the products that are available. Go to the next slide. Um, you have also nematodes. Nematodes are uh, natural enemies that are available in the system. They can also attack uh, the insect and then multiply. Um, so, in summary, about the biopesticide, you have uh, the viruses, you have the bacteria, but you have also the fungus and the nematodes. So, the fungus can be used for the control of the eggs, or the larvae, or the pupae, or the adults. But when you need to control the larvae, uh, you need, they need to be ingested, so you have to use uh, viruses, or you can use also bacteria whereas the nematode can also attack the larvae as well as the pupae. Next. So you also have neem extract. When you go in many places, farmers in Kenya, there are those who use chemicals, but majority, I can confess, go also for indigenous solutions. For instance, go to the previous one, I've not finished. There is the use of neems, a neem extract and other plant concoction. These are shown to be also effective. But these ones, they need to be infused with science. We need to come up with information on, to standardize, because from one location to another, the practice may vary, and the effect case also may change. So we need to do a lot of research here. Go to the next slide. Uh, we also have farmers who use these natural enemies or these nature-based solutions that they invoke. 
they do practices that promote these natural enemies to come to their rescues. One of such practices is the use of the fish soup. There are farmers in Malawi, they boil the fish, and then they make a concoction out of it, which they spray on the crop. And these attract a, a magnitude of uh, natural enemies, such as these ones. Uh, we are still identifying them, but all these are some of the groups that have been already reported as natural enemies of the fall armyworm. Because the fall armyworm belong to a genus, Spodoptera, that is available in Africa. And most of the natural enemies of those Spodoptera also are associating themselves with the fall armyworm. So we do a lot of work to disseminate, but it's not enough. So continue. We do cartoons. So all I'm trying to say that is in this process, we should not leave anybody out, common citizen as well as church people, mosque people, and the policymakers. But we should help them by giving them the right information. So go next. So in that sense now, what we are trying to do in our work is to try as much as possible to get the information, to collate information on the presence and absence, monitoring and surveillance, and use that information, use modeling and uh, data science to come up with practical information where policymakers should make decisions. Because it's not about just raising the problems and talking about the solutions, but where and when the solution should be implemented. So go to the next slide. So we have come up with a map of fall armyworm in Africa and also in Kenya and many other countries showing the seasonality of the pest. So this information can help government to prevent or to predict or private sector who have these biosolutions to plan ahead of time when they should, this information should be deployed. So we also give advice. I think this is what recommendation I want also to give in this talk. Uh, to give also practical advice on, as to how this solution should be implemented to uh, reduce chemical use. To, to also bring in private sector, Dr. Subi mentioned about the involvement of private sector and these people in the board of standards and pest product boards to come together to harmonize because if a biopesticide is developed in Kenya, it's not easily accessible in Ethiopia or in a neighboring country. Likewise, when some solution comes from those countries, it's not easy, so easy to bring them inside the country. Next slide. So for push-pull, the technology I mentioned, we need to work around uh, making the seeds available. You have managed to push the technology in many countries, but we need also a lot of work in terms of making the seeds available and explaining it. So in conclusion, I just want to say that these solutions there are just few of them that we know to enable us to avoid the use of synthetic chemical pesticides. So they are environmentally friendly, they are affordable, and they are self-perpetuating in the environment. So policy actions are needed to scale up this initiative and to support farmers to produce safe products in the context of the right for good and clean food. Thank you for the presentation. The pests and the alternatives may not manage Okay, uh, I think um, we should uh, go on this in, a, um, in an approach where we don't come back to a situation where it, things are disrupted. Huh? So definitely highly hazardous pesticides, we need to start looking at uh, which ones have to be removed out of the system immediately. And there is also, the pesticides also has uh, responsible uses because once you remove all of them, we have already spoiled the system. And some of those natural means are not there in good numbers to actually give you the, uh, the control. They, they need to be conserved slowly. Yeah? So in that case, I would uh, say that all the highly hazardous pesticides, which are clearly not having a good for us or for the system, has to go. But then we start looking at promoting agroecological uh, interventions uh, with time uh, to make sure that all these natural means that are uh, causing benefits to us can be conserved effectively. Uh, so that we come to a situation where our dependence on pesticides becomes zero. Uh, that's my immediate take on it. Uh, if you, the system is point. So if you remove it uh, completely, um, we don't know what can happen. So that needs to be studied also, yeah? Thank you. Uh, for the interest of time, uh, we appreciate your contributions. Uh, and uh, because you will be engaged elsewhere, we are also happy that we were able to finish on time so that we may not inconvenience you in 
the rest of your agenda. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in uh, 2021, uh, we had uh, what we call the Kenya Pesticide Task Force, for which I was a member, and we prepared a dossier on the pesticide use in the country, uh, their fate in soil, in food, and uh, recommendations. So I'm um, so recognizing that there are various types of products. That is why our organization is called Pest Control Products Board to recognize that we have biopesticides over and above the conventional chemicals. So in my presentation, I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll also give highlights on the petition uh, number 70 of 2019, then action that we have taken. So PCPB was established way back in 1985, following the enactment of the Pest Control Products Act in 1982. So you can see we have been in operation for many years. And uh, the main purpose of this organization is to regulate the importation, exportation, manufacture, distribution, sale, and use of pest control products in Kenya. We regulate quite a range of products. The first group is products that are used in crop production. Uh, we have herbicides, we have insecticides, we have also fungicides. And then we also have public health products. These are products for management of various uh, public health uh, pests, for instance, cockroaches, rodenticides, uh, and then we also have products for management of mosquitoes. Previously, we used to manage um, even veterinary medicines, uh, but there was an establishment of veterinary medicines directorate in, uh, in 2018, and since that time, we transferred the responsibility of regulation of animal health products to veterinary medicines directorate. So currently, we operate uh, using six subsidiary registrations. We have the licensing of premises regulation. We have the registration of products regulation. We have labeling, packaging, and advertising regulations. We have importation, exportation regulations, fees and other charges, and finally, disposal. These six sets of regulations were done way back in 1984 and they have been going through various uh, amendments uh, because we have been having a few challenges, particularly on registration of products. In the recent past, as it was mentioned earlier by uh, previous speakers, we have been having a number of pest attacks which were not previously there, and uh, this has been threatening food security in this region. And what we, are, what we noted is that most of the pests that have come of late, they cannot just be managed by just watching them. There is therefore need to have interventions if we are to ensure food security and also reduce yield losses. This really requires collaborative effort among various agencies, including uh, root to food and uh, people who are really championing biopesticides. If you could just go back to the previous slide. Yeah. Um, Misread on necrosis, for instance, was one of the major pests that we witnessed uh, some time back. And then we have uh, fruit flies. We have the most recent, which is the desert locust. And then we have leaf miner, uh, that is the uh, tuta absoluta, and four armyworm. Now, if you look at these pests, they have been threatening our own food security and our export market. And uh, for instance, if you look at uh, desert locust, we tried all means. When the desert locust invaded our region, we actually requested anybody who had any management option to give us a, a solution to the problem which was very threatening. And the challenge that we are, face, we are facing in this region is that being in the tropics, any pest or disease that finds its way in this region finds a very fertile ground to multiply unlike in other countries. Now in this region, we have very good temperatures, we have very good conditions that allow growth of crops, uh, including very nice fruits. Equally, the conditions are also very good for proliferation of those pests. And these pests, as we ourselves, as we are fighting for survival and talking about food security, they are also very smart. They are also identifying 
areas where they can survive. If you, for, for instance, if you look at the fruit fly, it is not by coincidence that a fruit fly is found on a mango. It actually lays eggs on a mango so that they can continue multiplying. If you look at, uh, for instance, the leaf miner, it is not by coincidence that it burrows through the, the leaves of tomatoes. It is because it is looking for food for survival and it's hiding so that even when you apply a product, you, you don't, do not touch it. If you look at uh, four armyworm, where does it hide? In the funnel of maize. It's not by coincidence. It is mainly because it's also trying to hide the young, the young ones so that they can continue proliferating. So management of these pests is not very easy. It's not just something that we can wish away. It's something that requires advanced technology and also use of multiple tools. Next slide. Um, this, for instance, is mango weevil. It's a simple pest, but the way it is survives, it lives inside a mango fruit for obvious reasons. It knows that the mango fruit is very good, and for sure it will get enough nutrients inside there. Although it's only one or two in a mango, how many of us can eat a mango fruit when it has only one pest? Maybe none, which means, although it is only one, we still require to manage the pests. Then look at the next one, the next photo. Just a minute, please, yeah. I took this photo somewhere in a farm here in Kenya. This is uh, kales. I did not purposely put it there. I found it somewhere in a farm. If you look at the number of caterpillars on one leaf of kales, they are very many. How many of us can afford to eat these kales with this number of caterpillars. So without management, it is almost impossible to produce enough food for our people. Next slide. So although we are talking about pesticides, it is recognized all over the world that there is need to regulate pesticides. And the reason is that they are known to be toxic. They are actually designed to be toxic to a living organism. Because the previous uh, pests that I've shown you can see they are active. Even if you talk about a bacterium, it requires a product that can kill so as to reduce the population of those pests. So they are naturally supposed to be somehow toxic to a living organism. And that is why world over regulatory agencies have been formed so as to evaluate the pesticides. So there are various types of hazards. We can have maybe hazard to human, it can be having physical hazards, can be having environmental hazards. And because there are also chances of the products not being effective, it's also good to check on uh, the efficiency of those products. And the world over, people conduct risk assessment so that as you use the products to manage the pest, then you also look at the management and also come up with mitigation measures. So here in Kenya, we are not the only ones who do evaluation. Before products are allowed for use, they go through evaluation where products have to be tested on uh, test animals. We have the guinea pigs, we have rats, we have rabbits, and also the big old dogs. And for instance, the guinea pigs are used for skin sensitization studies. Rats are used for acute oral and uh, acute dermal studies. Rabbits are used for eye irritation. And then we have the, the dogs that are used mainly for the short-term dietary intake studies. So the do these animals are actually sacrificed so that people can understand how the pesticide works if it happens to be in touch with a human being. Then, after the studies are conducted, there are end points. For instance, we have the LD50 values that are generated. We have the no observed effect levels that are also generated. Let's assume, for instance, that when you do a study on a, on a dog, you find maybe the no observed effect level is two milligrams per kilogram body weight. In order to ensure it's safe to human, that is reduced by a reduced a factor of 100 which means for the acceptable daily intake for such a product, then 
the acceptable daily intake is reduced to 0 0.02. So at two milligrams, no effect on a dog. Now for safety to human, in order to take care of the species differences, and of course differences in the uh, consumers, there could be young children, there could be adults, then you have a safety factor of 100, and therefore the acceptable daily intake is much lower than even what is observed in the test animal. Next. So pesticides can also have some negative effects on non-targets. And again, there are also data that are submitted by the agrochemical companies in order to look at the effects of the non-targets. And internationally, we also have uh, guidelines provided by FAO and WHO to guide on the registration and also sale of products in the market. So it is only if a product is found to be effective and have no unacceptable risk to human or the environment that is allowed for sale. So coming up now back to the petition, we had a petition number 70 of 2019 that was filed in Parliament. And in this petition, it proposed the withdrawal of harmful pesticides in the Kenyan market. So when it landed in Parliament, it was presented to the Departmental Committee on Health, and they went through processes where the petitioner submitted uh, details, and then our sales PCPB, we also submitted the technical details, and we had also the agrochemical industry submitting some uh, details of how they felt about the withdrawal of products. So after evaluating all the submissions, the Departmental Committee on Health came up with 17 recommendations. And broadly speaking, they rotated around legal review of pest control, product act, and regulations. The second recommendation broadly talked about review of products in the Kenyan market. Then it also talked about urgently enhancing funding of the regulatory agencies. Then it talked about PCPB uh, publishing the list of products that have been withdrawn, banned uh, in Kenya. They also talked about speeding up the completion of a pesticide residue laboratory currently under construction at PCPB. They talked of the Ministry of Health should be conducting epidemiological studies in areas where pesticides are used. They also talked about enhancing and promoting uh, training and awareness creation on use of pesticides. They also recommended that the Ministry of Education should develop and operationalize a curriculum and introduce uh, the topic of pesticide use uh, at all levels. They also emphasized on the need to collect data on pesticide use and also introduction of a concept on um, concept of spray, uh, using spray service providers. So this was actually sent to various institutions that have a responsibility uh, to uh, address these recommendations. So as PCPB, what we did after receiving the recommendations, we recognized that there was need to have a pool of experts who look at the, the areas that have been uh, recommended by the Department of Committee on Health. And we sent letters to various local institutions requesting them to nominate experts uh, to assist in the review of the products. And uh, six institutions responded positively, and we were given a total of 12 experts. Uh, namely, we had uh, uh, proposals from Kefis, Caro, Kemli, Isipe, Toxicological Society of Kenya, and Masai Mara University. So out of these, we selected four experts whom we felt uh, could assist in hazard and risk assessment. Um, we also posted on our website uh, information to the public that we are in the process of reviewing various molecules as indicated here. And we requested the members of the public to give uh, comments to PCPB. So there were 32 molecules that were mentioned in the petition. And so far we, were, we have been able to evaluate uh, four active ingredients, that is diuron, diacroprid, pyrimetrozine, and clothalnil. And we prepared a report for consideration by the board. But before that, uh, we felt there is need to share the information with the public. 
as the recommendations of that uh, team of experts so that the public can make comments. Then after that, it will be submitted to the board of management where the final decision will be made. So in addressing uh, the legal review, we have been conducting the review of the Pest Control Products Act and uh, regulations with the support of uh, AGRA, that is Alliance for Green Revolution Africa. And we also conducted 18 consultative meetings at the county level uh, where that seven counties give their input on the, both the bill and the regulations. We also conducted regulatory impact assessment on the regulations as required by law and also sought uh, concurrence on the, both the regulations and the bill with the national and the county government. Then we had a lot of stakeholder engagement thereafter and we sent the documents to the Ministry of Agriculture for purposes of forwarding to the Attorney General and we are waiting uh, for the Parliament to settle down so that they can look at the review. So on this area, we, we request that we can get support both by the industry, policymakers, and other uh, institutions. We'll be happy to have the bill and the regulations going through. Just a few highlights on what we did to address the recommendations from Parliament. The regulations provide for minimum qualifications of agrovets and also provides for registration of the dealers of those pesticides. It provides for adoption of globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, unlike the current system where we are using the WHO classification. It also provides for licensing of spray service providers, which was also highlighted in the parliamentary recommendation. It provide, provides for registration of qualified persons to handle uh, pesticides in form of uh, spray service providers. It also clearly provides the role of county government, particularly when they are conducting extension and also to create awareness uh, on issues to do with the pesticides and the management of pesticide empty containers. Uh, one other recommendation was on budgetary allocation. So to address this, we submitted a supplementary budget request to parliament. Uh, then we also submitted a proposal to the Departmental Committee on Health uh, for funding, but so far we have not received any official feedback. Now, on awareness creation, PCPB enhanced training and awareness creation, and we've been collaborating very well with the Agrochemicals Association of Kenya, the Ministry of Agriculture, and HCD. Uh, particularly last financial year, which just ended in June, we had 78 awareness creation activities. And then we also collaborated with the Micro Enterprise Support Program, where we participated in a number of radio shows. We had Inoro FM, Egeza FM, Radio Maisha, and Kaya. I particularly attended Inoro FM. Then we have also presented a number of papers uh, in webinars and other conferences. In terms of um, strategy for communication. We are working on it with the Koli ACP. And basically what we are emphasizing is that PCPB alone may not be enough to do uh, awareness creation. So we need to work together with stakeholders and the need to revive extension cannot be overemphasized. Well, um, there was a lot of mention of European Union and how products have been banned there. And in order to address our local capacity as PCPB, we have partnered with the Koli ACP, and they are assisting us in terms of training on the pesticide risk assessment, uh, where we have engaged trainers from the UK Chemical Regulatory Directorate, and they have been training our technical staff on risk assessment. There are a number of components that we have included in this partnership with the Koli ACP, which I've listed there. And then on capacity building, we have also been working very closely with FAO, the Netherlands, uh, the Wageningen University, again on the risk management. We have also been working very closely with the Swedish chemical agency. As we speak now, we have uh, about two of our people who are already going through training in Sweden. Then we have also been collaborating very closely with the, within the East African community, again trying to build capacity within this region. On spray service providers, again, we have also worked very hard 
we have over 1,500 uh, trained young people who have been trained on how to deal with the pesticides. Next, please. Now, for the issues to do with the residues, we have a residue laboratory that uh, we have constructed. That's a building on the right side. And this has been funded purely by the National Treasury through funding from the Kenyan government. So recognizing the need for us to look into the residues that we may be having in the local market, and of course, even for export. It will also look at the quality of commodities in the Kenyan market, quality of water, which was mentioned earlier, and also soil, whether there are residues in soil. So this is currently ongoing, and we are hoping that we will be having uh, maybe other partners who can uh, support us in terms of equipping the laboratory. Next. Then on importation, we have a regulation that looks at importation of pest control products, and it will ensure that not any product is brought into the country. We have the Kentrid system that monitors all chemicals that are coming into the country, so that before the products come in, we monitor and we evaluate what is coming in. Next, please. Then, apart from operating locally, Kenya also works together with other international agencies. We, Kenya is a signatory to the Multilateral Environmental Agreement on Pesticides, and we participate in all these meetings. We have the Rotterdam Convention, Montreal Protocol, Basel Convention, Stockholm Convention, and Minamata Convention. Now, in these conventions, people all over the world discuss the properties of products that may be having adverse effects on human and environment, and as a country, we discuss in this fora so that if the world decides to ban a certain product because of certain hazardous effects, Kenya also comes back and domesticates uh, that requirement. Then, currently, we have uh, banned 43 products. If you go to our website, you'll find 43 products that have been banned, and we have others that have been severely restricted. I can see I'm told time is almost up. Just give me one minute. All right. Then um, we have also been doing some surveys, also following recommendations from Parliament. This year alone, we have done three surveys. The first one is on pesticide use, where we have actually noted that uh, there is really need to collaborate with other partners to train farmers on safe use of products. Again, we also did another survey where we had 63 samples of kales, tomatoes, and onions that were sampled. And we looked at a number of molecules together with the Agrochemicals Association of Kenya. And we had some very interesting results that from the samples that we got, 63 of them, only one sample had exceeded Codex MRL. And what we noted is that 98.4% of the samples actually complied. But of course, if you look at the EU MRL, uh, some of them may, may fail the test. Um, we are also currently conducting a survey in collaboration with the Michigan State University in the U.S. and the USDA, and the aim of the current survey is to establish the level of non-conforming products uh, in the Kenyan market. So a few challenges that we are facing is, number one, the old law, which we are addressing through the review, uh, funding, as I had mentioned earlier, then we have the issue of polar borders. A few products may be coming from our neighboring countries. And lastly, next please, the issue of extension services. We really need to uh, re request the government to uh, have the extension services e enhanced so that they can train our farmers on how to use pesticides. My question was, I looked at what on the, the, the area of study uh, used by PCPD, and I only saw Kaku, and that is uh, good because they are looking at Subukia, Bahati, and the rest. But they have not mentioned Namamoflo, they have not mentioned Chuele, they have not mentioned the uh, Kibimi. So your question, your question is like, uh, their sampling areas have excluded the hotspots. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why is that? Or if it has been that, why has it remained silent? Okay. Because we, need, we are really having a lot of problems with the minimal residual levels, misuse of chemicals. Even in Uganda, the farmers will tell you, Mr. Omega, I'm not, the, 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 
a car recycle is being used in Kenya is not strong enough. So I'll go to Uganda to bring. And when they bring from Uganda, they are bringing an entity. What proportion is that? And uh, what is the plan for the remaining ones? Uh, because, uh, yeah, they, they are quite a number that, I mean, if you are talking of 76% of what is being used being hazardous, highly hazardous, then there are many more. What is the plan? And, um, uh, and yeah, and I wanted to know what is the like anticipated acceptance of this report and action by the government. I don't know who can answer that, but I just want to know like what is the anticipated action, like uh, acceptance of this report, and what because I know you say that um, most pesticides are uh, hazardous, but when you talk of highly hazardous pesticides and which have been banned from the countries where they are produced. They are not being used there, they are just coming to, it's like we are dumping them in Kenya and, and in Africa. We can't just say that they are, all, all pesticides are somehow pest, uh, hazardous. Those are highly hazardous. Some are carcinogenic. They need to be like banned immediately. So what is the action? We can't, we, we, it's been three years since the first time I heard of this death toxic business. So uh, what is the action that is being done? They need to be banned immediately. What is the action? My questions are as follows. One, just short ones, uh, One, why can't we have done this regionally? Regional, Eastern Africa with the nine, seven countries that we have to appreciate the cross-transboundary movements of these compounds so that those in Uganda, Southern Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi could appreciate the headache of the problem. Same follows this, that this edition is for Kenya, really. Why Kenya could fit in the Eastern African region? Think about it, so that we don't talk about localized here, whereas our neighbors are exporting DDT to destroy our cows. A second short word is this. Where is the list, Ngaruya? The total list of banned pesticides worldwide, and that is already not being brought to Kenya, but being brought to Kenya illegally so that we distinguish if it is atrazine, do we use it? We really want specific information so that we don't make conclusions without proof. The last one, are you sure, Sikuku, that we will actually have total amounts of organics of any type to produce 10 hectares of maize or 15 hectares of wheat, utilizing, using in organic material. My questions are very uh, simple and small. One is, uh, Dr. Garoya talked about uh, the problem of the porous borders. I just want to know what is happening because it's a real problem. Uh, farmers allowed in Nairobi and Kiabu area are going to Tanzania to get any chemical that they fight to fight tuta absoluta. So I would like to probably know what, uh, what, is, what is being done. The other one is a comment that uh, we, we heard about uh, biopesticides. We have heard about these essential, inse essential insects that are beneficial to the plants. And uh, we have heard that they are coming from outside. What are we doing in Kenya? We need to think uh, how we are going to promote them and also to promote those uh, interventions that farmers are trying, which have not been researched, and they are very good. We have got very good plants, plants with pesticide properties, but what is happening to us? We are just, uh, I think we are just discussing about them, but very little is happening in terms of enhancing their research and uh, including packaging and all that so that they can also be in the market. The private companies have taken it up and uh, they are producing some of the biopesticides, but they are, very, uh, they are very expensive and many farmers cannot afford. Uh, talking about the scope of our sampling, and why we did not go to other areas. Um, as I said, this is just the beginning because as PCPB, we realized that we have various types of data coming from all over and we decided with the agrochemical industry that we needed to get our own data 
really to get the situation on the ground. We started with Nakuru, Kajiado, and Nyandarwa counties because they are known in uh, uh, horticulture production and uh, we intend in the future to scale it up and go to other hotspot areas. And as I said in our survey that we are doing now, we, in collaboration with the Michigan State University, we are taking 10 counties and we are looking at the level of non-conforming products. And uh, this time around, Kirinyaga is included in the survey that we are doing. Then my other com uh, observation is uh, the question from Dr. Ray, uh, asking how we deal with uh, beneficial soil organisms. Um, it is only that time could not allow, but in the process of evaluating products, companies submit data on non-target organisms. For instance, as a representative so for soil organisms, we have studies on earthworms. For representative studies for invertebrates, we have studies done on bees, uh, mainly focusing on oral administration and also contact. Then for those representing uh, organisms in water, we have daphnia studies, and then we also have studies done on fish. So this is not just a Kenyan way of doing it, this is an international way of uh, evaluating pesticides. Then the other question was on the issue of 76% 77, of uh, being, uh, products being imported being highly hazardous. Um, unfortunately, this list was not shared in advance, so I'm not sure which the 76% is, but uh, what I know is that there are various definitions of highly hazardous, hazardous products. Um, if you look at the FAO definition of a highly hazardous product, um, they classify using eight-point criteria. And for instance, all those that are under WHO class one are actually classified as highly hazardous. Fumigants that we use to treat our grains uh, is classified as highly hazardous. Now, if there is another better op alternative to fumigate our maize in silos, we, do, we don't mind, we could use it. But because of lack of better alternatives, better alternatives, really, that can control the pests that we have in this region, we have to use some of those products, but to be used by trained professionals. If you talk about methyl bromide, all over the world, there was an attempt to withdraw use of methyl bromide. And in Kenya, we also tried to phase it out. But right now, as we speak, as we export our cultural produce to other destinations, they are saying you cannot export unless you treat with methyl bromide. So we are caught in between a rock and hard place. The need to export clean produce with no pests, at the same time, the need to protect our environment. So that is the reason. So for now, we do not have methyl bromide in the country, but it's like other countries, including Australia, India, they are dictating that before you can export, you must fumigate with methyl bromide. So what do we do as a country? So that is why some of them are there. Um, rodenticides, we all have, we know about rats. Rats can only be killed using highly toxic products because they are mammals. So what other options do we have? So for now, WHO class one, some of them are necessary. They are really necessary because of the situations that we are facing uh, practically. So uh, we, would, we wouldn't mind if we can get a list of the 76% of the molecules that were said to be banned. Then when it comes to banning, um, the international way of banning products is through the multilateral environmental agreements. And Kenya participates in all those meetings, both at the committee level and even at the high level. So if products are banned all over the world, we actually come back and domesticate those decisions. So what is banned elsewhere basically has also been banned in Kenya. However, countries can also make individual decisions. Like for instance, I know a few products are under review in the European Union. Now, they have introduced hazardous way, I uh, mean, uh, for, for in terms of uh, evaluation, they do hazard evaluation for some of the uh, products based on certain properties. In this area, because of the situations I mentioned earlier in my presentation, we have some unique situations like the desert locust, which do not occur in Europe. And therefore, it might not be possible for us to copy and paste policies that are done in the European Union and paste them here. 
majority of the products that, are, that were mentioned in the petition were actually not banned in the European Union, but they are under review. Majority of them are not banned in the US, but they are under review. Majority of them are not banned in Japan. The majority of them are not banned in Australia. So if we are to ban, maybe we'll be uh, one of the few countries in the world to ban those products. But where are the issues? We are part of the global uh, arena. We are discussing the issues. And if there is need, then you take action. So we are currently targeting to evaluate the 32 that were in the petition, and we have already done four. And the outcome may be that we ban, depending on the situation, or we restrict some of those products, or we allow for use but under special conditions. But I don't want really to uh, put everything here because we are still debating on those molecules. Then Professor Mishieka made a very... Oh, sorry, Prof. All right. yeah, we can keep it brief so that yeah. because there is great interest for other members to... Okay, thank you. Then uh, list of banned products. They are on our website. We have a list on our website. And this has been a continuous activity. As I said, we have been participating in many international meetings. And where there are major issues, we don't just leave. We come back and domesticate. So the list of the uh, 43 products are on our website. And they can be accessed anytime. Um, Dr. Nehemiah on the porous borders, how we are addressing them. Um, Kenya has been participating in the harmonization efforts under the East African community, and we are hoping that uh, once the treaty is fully operational, then we will not have an issue of highly toxic products moving from one country to another. So we are also working on how to evaluate products together uh, as a region made up of seven partner states. Then on the issue of biopesticides, um, I heard that uh, most of them are from outside. Uh, that is not really true. We have a number of biopesticides that are also done in Kenya. And I recall in the year 2006, Kenya was among the first few African countries to come up with the guidelines for registration of biopesticides. And we recognized three groups. We have the microbials, the macrobials, and biochemicals. And we, it, we, the board went on, out of its way to encourage local innovations. We, that is why we have companies like Dudutech, they produce and even export. We have other companies, uh, ECP has also been very active in the development of uh, biopesticides. Um, I think one other is that uh, in the bill that uh, I said is almost going to parliament, we are provided for local innovations that the board will put in place measures to encourage local innovations. So hopefully, if the bill goes through, then you start seeing some new developments. Thank you. This is, uh, um, this is very relevant all over, especially on the continent. We heard that the continent has so far a low share of sales, but we saw also the table where we saw the increases and the biggest increase by 63%, if I recall correctly, is on the continent. So it's a very important question. The answer are resources, and we also were able to obtain effects and data on Kenya that allowed us to make the statements. So uh, this is one of the answers. Our colleagues, by the way, in Nigeria do very similar work and will um, also publish soon a similar, um, a similar product with information on the pesticide use. Okay. Okay. There is a people in the University Council of East Africa, which I chaired very important. They can actually talk to the information to the Eastern African countries easy without extra cost. Then you can then put it together, all those people under that cost. That is important. We will, we will come back to you and, and see what we can do there. Um, on the question of the 44%, that was also your question, uh, the, the list, I would, my, my colleague will answer to that. I would just make one remark, which is we are um, international organizations headquartered in Germany. So I think it is our responsibility to work uh, on these double, uh, double standards and to advocate for a stop of 
export of those products and ingredients that are not allowed for use anymore in the European Union. I just want to reply to some of the questions and I see there's a bit of confusion about the percentage of highly hazardous pesticides and the percentage of banned pesticides. So we've got the, the pesticide use data show 76% are highly hazardous pesticides and 44% are banned. And the reason is not all highly hazardous pesticides are banned in Europe. So even in Europe and all other countries, there are still highly hazardous pesticides in use. And that's uh, that might answer Liz's question. Um, and uh, about the list of banned pesticides based on the pesticide use data, the information is there and it will be probably published soon in a report. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the information is there and you just need to get in contact with us to get that information. And just one last thing, um, the fact that biopesticides are quite expensive, um, I just want to also mention that biopesticides are not the only resort. Um, they should also be the last resort in pest control. So we really need to focus on transformation of a system and looking and improving soil and water management to really give the plants and the crops the best environment they can get. And uh, just one comment to PCPB, um, I don't think invasive species can, can be the reason for keeping highly hazardous pesticides uh, on the market. So there's always the option to, to ban them with the exemption to control certain pesticides like locusts you just mentioned. It's always the same example coming from, um, from various stakeholders promoting these highly hazardous pesticides. So we really need to look at, at innovation and transformation versus creating fear and stay with business as usual. So I just want to give some general reactions to some remarks, Dr. Nguria, that you have given in your presentation and to what we're doing here today. This conversation hasn't started today in 2022. We started uh, long before that and with the tabling of a peti petition in 2019. So this dispute or this like real focus on the fact that we need a list of the 76 active ingredients that have recently been obtained by the Route to Food Initiative is not the main focus. Um, there, were, there are 270 active ingredients registered by the PCPB in approximately 800 products. Um, this, was, you know, this was presented in a white paper published by the Route to Food Initiative in 2019. Um, from that, that was the basis of the petition. From that, there's been a circular saying now there's 30 active ingredients, and we learned today that of those 30 active ingredients, four have so far been reviewed. I want to highlight that PCPB also issued a circular before the petition was tabled on two of the active ingredients that were mentioned today by Dr. Nguria. This is chlorothalonil and diuron. So these active ingredients have been under review since 2019. And we are now almost the end of 2022. The message today is clear and one that Liz clearly pointed out, my colleague here, Elizabeth. We need urgent action to remove highly hazardous pesticides from the Kenyan market. This is not a Kenyan problem. It is a global problem, an emerging issue that countries around the world are trying to address. And we need to consider how to move towards a just transition and agroecological practices, call it what you will, sustainable practices, sustainable agriculture. Um, in order to do that, I have a problem where people are saying that agroecology or integrated pest management strategies are non-scientific or non-modern. We saw this in the group chat on Zoom. It will require considerable science and considerable technology in order to be able to effectively roll out transition to a sustainable agriculture and to do so at scale. The lead and the cues for these people who are holding this knowledge is sitting in independent science and civil society. We have talked to here Dr. Nguria a lot about involving all people, but at the same hand, we have, talked, we have seen there's a close affiliation with crop life, represented here today by Agrochemicals Association of Kenya and Agra, who both hold strong profit-orientated interests in maintaining the status quo around the world. My call to action for today would be three things. 
I resound the call to action for increased participation of independent scientists drawn from a vibrant and energized civil society, nationally and internationally. I resound the call for increased funding for the PCPB to be able to independently execute its mandate without being reliant on funding from the private sector whose interests are not aligned with a just transition towards a more sustainable agriculture safe and safe food and farming system. And lastly, I stand here to request urgent action to progressively move highly hazardous pesticides from this country. Well, um, I think uh, my comrade here has just spoken what I wanted to say. But my question is this, I had uh, uh, PCPB say that they didn't get response from government on funding. Where do you get your money? That's the first question. And whoever funds you, what interest do they have? You have constantly mentioned working with agrochemical industries. And she has said rightly that they promote their businesses. Are you here representing them or Kenyans? Because NCPB, you are being paid by Kenyans. Whose interest are you representing? When have you come to us to ask us? Because as a movement, and she has said that farmers are scientists. Scientists don't have to have white lab coats uh, having glasses in laboratories. Our farmers have been conducting research for millions of years. When have you come to them? And then lastly, you've spoken about uh, working um, trainings with Swedish chemical agencies. You know, in all of your presentation, it seems you are talking on their behalf. When will you start speaking? on behalf of the producers. And Professor Micheka, my able professor, I met him in Apakabete, I was a student in Apakabete campus. I took range management and he said that uh, organic means are expensive. Do you know why? Because government is not funding them. Yes, that is the reason. We are having various innovations by smallholder farmers. But if you look at the policies of the government, the policies of government are oriented. He said about methyl bromide to Australia. Why, what business do you have feeding Australians when Kenyans are starving? I have a question uh, following Dr. Silke's presentation. I think it is evident that we're using a lot of herbicides, some of which are classified as, as highly hazardous. So my question is, are there any documents that list the recommended maximum residue levels in soils? I've noticed that there's a lot of focus on maximum residue levels in food, but little on soil and the impact that these herbicides are likely to have on, on soil microorganisms. Um, I want to say that I'm so proud of uh, Kenya for making um, this pesticide at last possible. Uh, Nigeria has been uh, mirroring, trailing your steps. And um, it's uh, very, very necessary that, um, you know, like one of the earlier uh, commenters uh, made mention, uh, we need to take advantage of regional collaboration um, there's a global movement to see how we could stop the double standard in the pesticide uh, exports to developing countries like us. Uh, so it's very, very necessary that we uh, make uh, good efforts to ensure regional collaboration, to take a very, very strong stand uh, to stop the export of highly hazardous uh, pesticides. Um, on my, my question, uh, which will be going to the Kenya Food Safety Agency, uh, would be uh, to know if they have any phase-out plan for highly hazardous pesticides that are already banned. Do we have a blueprint or a phase-out uh, strategy for, for this? And um, I think I heard a comment, a question, where someone was asking, um, is food production or the safety of uh, consumers, you know, uh, more of a priority? Um, so as a food safety agent, my question is, um, uh, why are they not at the front? I mean, they should be at the front. Why are they not at the front uh, in the promotion and call for uh, biopesticides and other nature-based uh, alternatives? Um, so it will be very, very necessary to know um, the role of food safety agents in terms of promoting uh, the alternative. Uh, so from uh, 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 all of us in Nigeria, I want to say a big congratulations to um, HBS Kenya and the Kenya, uh, Kenyan family, the Kenya people. Um, you guys are brilliant and we really, really commend uh, this effort. Africa can be the organic capital of the world. Thank you. And I think then that we need to... Um, take um, cognizance and advantage of. I have uh, just like two or three questions, one of which is 
Recently, when uh, there were reports that some of Kenya's avocado exports had been banned in certain countries over some product, I'll call it uh, CHP because I can't pronounce <laughs> the entire name. And I engaged PCPB and uh, Dr. Kimani told me that uh, the chemical was actually banned on avocados. We went to the PCBB website to raise a list of chemicals that had this as an active ingredient. And uh, some of them were listed from a company called Dow that uh, is no longer uh, in existence, having uh, merged with uh, Coteva. And uh, they told me that they even discontinued the use of that particular uh, product, yet it was still listed on the PCPB website. And I'd like to ask PCPB whether it was an oversight or once we discontinue importation or even manufacture of certain products, they still remain on your website. Uh, number two, uh, you mentioned PCPB again about the challenges we have with extension services. I've heard that a million times. What exactly is the issue with our extension services? Uh, lastly, I'm not an expert. I said I'm a journalist, but I can answer somebody who asked what happens with the doodles that we manufacture after they are done eating other doodles. I am told, and by the way, um, Kenya is the arguably the most vibrant uh, country in the world when it comes to IPM. We export a lot of this technology and we have a good number of uh, companies that are in uh, Dudu manufacturing. The real IPM, Copart, Andermatt, Kenya Biologicals, Dudu Tech, Isipe. Kenya is actually on the global map. I'm saying that not as an industry player or an interested party, but as a journalist, disclaimer. Uh, so I'm told once they are done eating the bad guys, bad guys is uh, a phrase that uh, these fellows use. They say we have the good guys who eat the bad guys, especially in flowers. Once they are done eating the bad guys, they eat each other. So I don't know what happens to the last guy. Now, for me, I want to go basic because there is one question which is disturbing me as I was following the conversations. Because I want to ask myself, why are farmers using these banned substances? Why are farmers using pesticides? Chances are that these pesticides are working for them. The only bad part is that they are compromising on food safety. And so when biological control methods or the biopesticides are presented, the question that begs is, are these biological control methods as effective is the methods that they are using. And could it be that they are not aware? So as we respond to that, for me, I think we need to shift the conversation from the problem finding because we're in a sorry state of affairs. We have a lot of problems and they are there in the pesticide atlas to a solutions-based conversation. And so the challenge would be for me to challenge HBS, just like the way we've had this particular forum, which to me, there is a lot of problem finding. Can we have a forum that we discuss and we, we critically look at the proposed alternatives? Are they practical for the farmers? Because at the end of the day, there must be a reason why farmers are not using these biological control methods. So how I wish, Director, we can have a conversation centered on solutions. I want to thank the team that organized this Pesticides Atlas meeting. Why? Because right now, Kenya, East Africa, Africa, and indeed the globe is faced with an ecosystem existential threat. Let that sink in. One of the reasons for that, as you can see from the reports, is use or reckless use of synthetic pesticides. In case you didn't know, please know. Secondly, over the last 35 years of medical practice, we've noticed an increase of cancer. Listen to this very carefully. Even this weekend, we are traveling to go and bury people, and all of you here. Yeah? What has caused this increase 
of cancers, diabetes, heart diseases, strokes, yeah, and all sorts of other conditions that we doctors are cleaning the mess, what we call mopping the floor. Good people, the problem is upstream. How we grow the food and what we use to grow the food. And that's why I told people, I left clinical practice and went to work with farmers. Why? Because food is medicine. And if farmers are growing food that is safe, then we are all safe. There is no you and us, all of us here. Right now there's a drought in this country. And that's why we say those who want to bring in GMOs, bring them in, but bring them as grains, make food available, because the difference is between life and, and death. But make sure that that food that comes in is safe. Why? FAO defines food security as food that's available to all people at all times that meets their nutritional preferences, but also that significantly is safe. Is safe. Is our food safe? No, most of our food is not safe. One of the reasons why our food is not safe is because of that unchecked use of synthetic pesticides, chemicals, and agrochemicals. Even those who produce them know that. This is why in Missouri, where former Monsanto now Bayer was based, those guys who are producing GMOs, guess what they were eating in their restaurants? Can you guess? Organic. So, <laughs> so good people. We are on the same boat. There is no Professor Micheka supporting GMOs and Dr. Mokaya supporting organic. No, 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 no. We all want safe food. We are all on the same boat. We all want the best interest for all Kenyans, all Africans, and everybody on this earth. Therefore, mine is a call to action. We cannot stop pesticides immediately. As Professor Micheka said correctly, it's impossible. But let us determine to shift our mindset from protecting vested interests of the big agrochemical companies, which we all know, and those interests are in here, to looking at what's better for humankind, for the common good of all people. Those people dying out there, we bury them. They're costing us money in the hospitals. Let's fix our food system. So my summary, and I'll speak on behalf of many other physicians, let us together, as Professor Micheka correctly said, sit together and find a way of reducing, I'm not saying stop, because organic can't feed the world right now, of reducing the use of especially these toxic, highly hazardous chemicals. So I want to make it a call to action very passionately that we can't sit here and protect business interests. This is a global existential threat. We will all perish. Right now you can see what's side bars in the US more than 70% are gone. Bees are gone. Many foods that we used to eat, you know, are not there anymore. So for me, this meeting is a trigger for a national conversation. Dear friends in Kenya, I am happy about this opportunity. And I am thrilled that it is also a Kenya edition of the Pesticide Atlas from the Heinrich Boll Foundation. Because the pesticide debate and associated action tackles critical issues such as environmental protection, the production of healthy food, and the protection of people from the effects of agricultural toxins. My name is Karl Beer. I'm a member of parliament in Germany. But I was approximately one year before my election engaged in environmental movement in Germany and Europe. I work for the Environment Institute in Munich and, among other things, co-founded the European Citizens' Initiative on Saving Bees and Farmers. Here we gathered over one million signatures to advocate for the gradual exit of the chemical synthetic pesticides used in the whole of Europe. That should be the goal for all of us, and I believe that we would do well to work together to achieve it. I will give you two examples of why the fight against pesticides is not a national one or one that can only take place in limited protected areas. 
The first example is something we, the Green Party, are doing as part of the federal government here in Germany. Our federal minister for agriculture and consumer protection, Jem Ozdemir, has proposed introducing a ban on the export of pesticides that are harmful to health and are banned here. An export ban will end the double standards of banning active ingredients here because we unanimously agree they are too dangerous. While at the same time, our companies in Germany and Europe still export these ingredients to other countries where they harm and damage humans and nature. I know you are fighting to register and ban toxic pesticides in Kenya, and we are fighting to stop the export now. That goes well together. We should get off these double standards. And the second example of why we can't fight here alone for the preservation of nature is the migratory birds, like the hopper. For example, you may know they are probably on their way to you now. When it's summer here, they're with us. If they can't find food for their offspring, they cannot come to you in winter. Conversely, if they disappear from your country, they will not be able to spend their summer in our country. If we want to preserve nature, we have to do it all over the world. And we have to preserve our biodiversity, our oceans, our forests, and everything that keeps us alive, especially our climate. And for this, we must fight together. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to pose has already been asked about the redress mechanism in, uh, in the event we consume uh, food that is full of uh, toxic pesticides and a consumer uh, uh, gets uh, affected or somehow develops some complications out of that. So that one has already been posed. But then I want to challenge um, the scientists that are in the house, the academia in the house, because most of the information that you have is seated in your shelves, is seated within your circles. And this information has not been broken down and also it has not be, it has not trickled down to consumers. Yet when you're talking about farming, all the produce that are coming from the farm system or the food system end up in my plate. So a consumer is a, a key stakeholder because we bear the burden of the food system. We bear the burden of production, we bear the burden of transportation, storage, and at the end of it, we bear the burden of that retailer in the market. So, I want to challenge you that even as you come up with this useful information, package it in a way that a common consumer can understand. Because if we understand what is contained in food, we will push for government to ensure that every product is in the market is labeled so that we can have a right to choose which product we are to buy for our own consumption. So mine is solution-based, uh, Mr. Uh, the, the one you said here that uh, this is a problem kind of best meeting, but I believe it's also solution-based and I'm offering this solution that let us break down this information uh, to the common consumer you and I know we are consumers, but there are those that cannot be able to break this information and digest this information for their own use. Uh, the government, I uh, represented ably, who you've had uh, the deep concerns of the general public, and uh, I hope that uh, this will bear fruit in the near future, that there will be an urgency uh, in the action plans. Of course, uh, all of us, the journalists, you are here, you know now there's need for communication. The scientist may speak in technical language, speaking to fellow scientists, but they, at the end of the day, when you come from your lab, you go home and eat food, like any other person. And so you need to, we need to be sure that what we eat is safe, for we are only as healthy as the food we eat. You know, when Dr. Ryu started talking, he reminded me, some of my teachers, because professor is here, you might think I'm talking about him, but uh, in primary school, you know, we had this parade in the morning. And there's this one teacher who would always come and say, I have nothing to add. I just want to do what? To echo. I want to echo what Mwalimu has said. 
So let me first of all echo what everyone has said. And then, uh, but I think I want to thank you all for a very lively and candid conversation today. It has, in be, it is a, it has actually been a very um, enriching and engaging morning, and uh, we appreciate that. It is clear from the discussions we have had today that we have a problem. And it is clear that we have some of the most toxic products in the world in our market today. And uh, even from the data presented and, and, and the discussions that 76% uh, in terms of volume, not in terms of active ingredients, but in terms of volume, of all uh, pesticides used in Kenya are classified as HHPs. And out of, uh, out of the pesticide we use, 44% would not have been used in the EU. So we, we have a problem. And I think it's clear that uh, even from uh, the discussions in the room and, uh, uh, and the presentations that we really need to, uh, to put an end to this double standard. I think if it is not safe in the EU, it cannot be safe here. Whatever you want to discuss about which approach they use, whether it's hazard-based or risk-based, if it is not safe for a human being in the EU, it is not safe for a human being in Kisi and uh, in Chwele, uh, where this uh, gentleman was presenting with the correct pronunciation of the Western uh, regions. So, the level of misuse and mishandling, as has been discussed, is clear that it's very high, that people are basically toying around with these pesticides out there. And we agree, we all agree that there's a problem in terms of how producers interact and use these products. We have moved over the last 15 years. I'm quite young, as I think some of you can visibly tell, but uh, when I was a small boy, we used to refer to pesticides as sumo. True or false? But today we refer to them as what? Dawa. When you call something dawa, what does it do to you? It desensitizes you. That now farmers are looking at pesticides not as poison. And I think people who are translating Swahili are doing as, uh, you know, a very bad disservice. When you translate pesticide, which means poison for pest, to dawa, which means medicine, you know, it's like someone goes to the, to the, to the shop and says, Nataka dawa ya panya. Is, is your rat sick? You know. Because you're desensitizing the public that this is not poison, this is medicine. It is not medicine. Let our people know the truth that the products that they are dealing with are poisons. And I think that becomes the conversation now when, Dr. when you're talking about awareness. I think it's very important that all of us are engaged in these conversations. It is not a responsibility of PCPB alone, but can we do the awareness correctly? Can we have that movement changing from Dawa back to Sumu, start from PCPB, so that people can understand that it's poison, it is not medicine. For most Kenyans, our farms are our homes. There are no adequate measures to protect a majority of rural populations that are constantly exposed to pesticides in the air, in the water they drink, and the food they eat. It is basically everywhere in the rural areas. Whether you are just walking around, you'll, someone is praying during the day without any consideration of the buffer and everything, you, people are basically exposed um, uh, because we live in those, in those farms. There is no way of avoiding exposure to consumers who have no guarantee whatsoever of the quality and safety of their food and who has grown it and how they have grown it. Farmers are also constantly exposed to all manner of risks due to inadequate awareness and knowledge when they use pesticides. And of course, because they are referring to them as dawa instead of sumu. We have no choice but to act. The Pest Control Products Board um, have said, and uh, I want, even if I'll be the only one in the room, but I want to really put a lot of trust in Dr. Ngaruya. He is a very nice gentleman, and I think the leadership of PCPB is, uh, you know, is, it has made commitments in the past that they are willing to work on these issues. What we just want to add, and I think you should clap for him. You know, there is a change. You know, you know uh, some time back you would call government people, they will not come. He has come, he has given us the information, he has presented, and I think, as someone has said, this is not us versus them. It is not us fighting against the government. Who elected this government? Not everyone, but I think collectively, it is us. 
So I think it's important that uh, we recognize that they are trying to put effort, but we need to really, we cannot stop to emphasize that they have to hold their mandate and their responsibility to a high standard, and they have to act urgently. As we have said, it cannot take four years or three years to, to review uh, four active ingredients and take action on them. I think it's important that we put the urgency of these issues uh, where it's supposed to be. So. Um, I really want to urge that there is acceleration on that front. The new government must also realize that this is a situation where, you know, this, uh, the old man said, because if you do not address, as, as, as Dr. Mokaya has said, uh, who is a very good friend of mine, despite the age difference, uh, but Dr. has said, if you do not address these issues, then you see them in the health, uh, appearing in the healthcare system. And we do not want that because it is more costly to deal with them, so we better deal with the issues that are there. And we want to encourage that we need to have conversations. There is a need for the government to actually invest in ensuring uh, that consumers are safe and that uh, the issues that are there should be arrested. But ladies and gentlemen and comrades, as uh, my Ebo comrade has used this word, I think someone mentioned alliance, but we are not going to mention when, where we went to school. But it is easy to dwell here, comrades, and complain and raise questions. But I want to go slightly beyond that. On a very serious note, that as we hold those directly responsible to account, which is the right thing to do, and we must continue to do that. To PCPB, we must continue to ask them, how fast are you doing this? Where are you with this process? To the industry, to AAK, we must continue to ask you to be responsible on, in the business that you do, to be responsible in making sure that the farmers who are getting these products understand the risks that are involved in that. So we must continue to hold them accountable. But we also must recognize that all of us collectively also have a role to play. Civil society organizations, regulators, politicians, academia, producers, consumers, all of us have a role to play in making sure that we see the change that we want to see and that we are forging forward towards a more sustainable and equitable food system. We all need to invest in awareness creation. I think it has been mentioned here severally. The awareness creation is not something that Dr. Ngaruya will move around this country and go to Chwele and go back to Kimana and everywhere and speak. I think this is something that all of us need to continue to do. We are here, we have learned something, can we share? Can we share to 10 people? Can we share to 50 people? And we must continue to do this because sometimes, as someone has mentioned, I am a farmer myself, and I, these days I interact with farmers a lot. Over the weekend, mostly I'm in Eldoret. Sometimes farmers just want to know, is there any alternative that works? If you cannot answer that question, then whatever else you're telling them does not work. So we all need to invest in these uh, conversations. So as I, as I end, and this is the first time I will say this, I'll say it like three times, but as I end, the late Professor Angari Mathai told the story of the hummingbird. How many of you have heard the story of the hummingbird? Ah, good. So I, I have the chance to tell it because some people have not heard it. But uh, Angari Mathai tells this story about the forest that caught fire. And all the animals ran out of the forest and stood by the side of the forest. And they looked as their home was being, you know, raged by this fire. But one hummingbird, very small bird with a tiny beak, decided to do something. So it was going to the forest, taking a drop of water, coming back, dropping it on the fire. But the other animals, eh, the, some of the big animals, like the elephants and all that, they were telling the hummingbird, what are you doing? What do you think you are doing? You cannot put out the fire. But it said, I am doing the best that I can. This conversation about pesticides and moving away from toxic pesticides has its hummingbirds. And uh, some of the hummingbirds are farmers like Sylvia Kuria who is very renowned for her organic farm in Deya, and who has made sure that she teaches as many people as possible that it is possible to grow without toxic pesticides. Some of these people include uh, Bona Nicolas Yano in, of DNRC in Makueni, who is teaching farmers that it's possible, the natural solutions that we are talking about are possible. Muranga Organic Farmers Cooperative, Kirinyaga, Busia Organic Farmers Cooperative, Machakos Organic Farmers Cooperative, who are not only growing and experimenting with these technologies and techniques in their farms, but also training people in their communities so that gradually we can start to change, as we have said, change the way people view uh, these issues. 
There is also a very good friend of mine called Gregory Kimani of City Shamba, who is doing kitchen gardens here in Nairobi and trying to show people that it's possible to grow safe food in the city. Charles Lucani of Voices for Change is doing the same. So people are doing their bit. Are we the ones telling them what are you doing? Are we the ones discouraging them? Then we need to be able to, to join them. Honro Boshable, who unfortunately was not able to join us, is definitely our humming bird in Bunge. And she has decided and taken this as a personal initiative to make sure that the political class gets this message and acts. And I think we should be able to appreciate that. The private sector also has its humming bird. I think someone presented some of the names here, and it's important to recognize that there are people who are working day and night to make sure that there are alternatives to these pesticides that are toxic. So that as we talk about facing them out, we also are building the conversation all the time. So going, going forward, I think it's important to not only raise questions, but to try as much as possible to provide answers to some of the questions that we raise, that it is important to invest in safer, sustainable alternatives at whatever scale and showcase what is possible. Finally, we should continue to urge all who have capacity to research on alternatives to continue to do so. Those who can publish and distribute information on alternatives to continue to do so. It is urgently needed, as we have discussed. Those who have spaces, and I'm speaking to very serious landowners here, and I know they are looking at me. So those who have spaces, whether it's farms or gardens, to donate them, yeah, to donate, donate them to demonstrate good practices, even at village level, show people the good practices and experiment on alternatives in our own spaces. We don't need funding to do that. Those in media to continue highlighting these issues, so this one I'm echoing what uh, Dr. Harry said, we continue to highlight um, and, and bring to their attention. And policy, we urge policymakers at all levels, at county level, at national level, to continue to invest resources towards food and farming systems that enhance rather than compromise our natural resources, which are the foundation of our food. The true cost of the status quo, leaving things as they are now, is higher than any investment we need to make to change the situation. So, and I want to urge the industry to continue because some uh, are already moving in this direction to invest in more safe, sustainable crop production uh, products. And I urge all of us to do the little things that we can do like the little hummingbird to stop the fire. It is possible to imagine a food system free from toxic pesticides, but it's also possible to achieve it. So, and uh, as uh, HBS, we continue to publish in this conversation, we continue to invest in conversations around alternatives. We have so much discussions around agroecological alternatives, whether at policy level, practical level, and we work with our partners who are doing uh, some very good work uh, on the ground in ensuring that these messages are there and these conversations are happening. So we promise to continue investing in providing spaces for dialogue like this, where people can come and discuss and find solutions forward. So I don't want to go beyond that, but I just want to urge us to keep this conversation going. Let us encourage dialogue. Let us talk openly without fear about these issues because this is not civil society versus industry. This is not people who are in government versus people who are outside government. This is about our food. It is about our health. It is about our farms. It is about our future. It is about our children. So we are all connected in this one big conversation.